Hey everyone, it's been a while. Today we're talking about The Law by Jim Butcher, and this is book 17 and a half in the Dresden Files series. It's also a novella. It's also something that's not narrated by James Marsters. We got Jim Butcher for this one, guys. This is not everybody's favorite Dresden Files book, but I think that The Law is way more important to the Dresden Files than anyone here is willing to admit right now. And we're going to have a nice long chat about exactly why I'm right on that. It's been a long time coming, but after two read-throughs of The Law, I'm finally ready to talk about the story. This is a story that's both really fun to read and it helps set the stage for a post-Battleground Dresden verse. We're going to get a little bit play-by-play -play at the beginning, just bear with me on that. Because, you know, I had thoughts and feelings as I read the story again. And then we're going to go deeper into some of the thematic elements because y'all know I have a flair for the thematic. And I'm going to talk about how I think the story ties together a bunch of other things that are going to be very important going forward in 12 months and Mirror Mirror. Time for the play by play. We begin the story with Harry only getting about three hours of sleep a night. I know I would be wrecked if that was my sleep schedule. He keeps reliving what happens to Murphy in Battleground and uses getting up early as an excuse to just get out of bed and stop having to deal with that. The coffee pot that he uses was refurbished by Michael, so hopefully it has the staying power and it won't break when Harry uses it. Coffee is probably the only thing keeping Harry going at this point, given his limited amount of sleep and the great amount of responsibility given his obligations to Mab and the people of his castle and really everyone in Chicago that he thinks of as being under his protection. So a functional coffee pot is an amazing gift in a way that an old ally can still help him even though Michael has been retired from his duties as the Knight of the Cross. Plus, we all know that a higher power has to help Harry not destroy technology that he needs to survive at this point. Will Borden is Harry's assistant, and honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Will has been by Harry's side for a really long time, and unlike his friends in the fairy courts, Harry can actually trust Will without feeling like he's walking into a trap. Will's an engineer, and he probably at least helps out the project managers on his job, so his skills make a lot of sense in this role as being Harry's personal assistant slash confidant. At this point on the second listen through, I started to appreciate the differences between Jim Butcher and James Marster's narrative styles. A lot of people did not like Jim Butcher's narration, and there were times when I could tell that he wasn't a professional voice actor. But voice acting is a totally different skill set from being an author, and I don't think it's really fair to compare the two since it takes a lot of skill to do both. I don't think that James Marsters could go out and write an urban fantasy series without having to work really, really hard to get it up to snuff. That's just how this stuff works. At this point, Marsters has the benefit of 17 full-length Dresden Files novels to get his rendition of Harry and his friends up to the level that we appreciate today. Yes, there were some heavy-handed moments, and honestly, I'm surprised and a bit impressed that Butcher could do multiple accents, so overall I think he did a good enough job. One thing that did bother me tremendously is that Will's voice and Bob's voice both sounded like I have butters in my head, but it's a novella, I can live with it. Will mentions that Harry has some discussions to participate in regarding his first date with Lara. Butcher doesn't really do throwaway lines, at least not after the book's in the middle of the series leading up to changes that I've been thinking a lot about lately. So I made a note that this might be important later. And I was right! I'll go into this later, but the way that they brought up Harry's appointment with Maya the Tudor Lady was really interesting. Harry asks if she was running from the Fae or had a bad vampire in her life, which makes me think of his mother. Harry seems to have the women in his life on his mind, and it impacts his judgment. Maya was described as looking a bit like Susan, but not in a love interest sort of way, which is really nice. When she was first brought into the story, I did have my reservations on whether or not she was being sincere or if this was sort of a trap you know, purposely put together to instigate Harry's emotions, but she ended up being okay. We'll talk more about the character that I dislike almost as much as I dislike Rudolph, but in chapter six, Bob lists things that Harry could do to stick trip Gregory into the Never Never Demon Reach, but Harry decides against it. Harry has the power to control Trip on his own, but he chooses not to use those ways earlier in the story, and this really keeps the feel of early Dresden alive. And this was a common vibe in this book, but we'll talk about that later. I found the scene where Dresden interviews Triple J, Trip's cellmate, to be really, really interesting. The guy is an enforcer on the inside for Marcone, and he has tattoos of tears to show his expertise in his field. He also calls Harry boss. Triple J reminds me of Ebenezer McCoy because McCoy calls Dresden Haas. They're in similar lines of work and seem to be older, wiser mentors to hot-headed youngins who don't know any better. We'll talk about more of this in detail. I just had to get this out of the way. It was really cool getting the backstory about the Maiden of Pain and Winter Winter and all that sort of stuff going on. And I think it actually explains a lot of stuff that happens on later on and how the magic system works in this world. Basically, this person, the Maiden of Pain, Hag, Apotheus, she's kind of like Kemler, but better for some definition of better. And she's Winter Winter's mother. 
He had nine siblings, but they didn't survive the battle. Winter Winter has a lot of magic, but no name, and he's worked for Kemmler and kicked a couple of world wars off. You know, swell guy. Mab Operation Paperclip him, and now he works for Winter. She can use him to cause strife and division, so that's probably why we didn't see him in Battleground. You know, he would have just made things worse. Harry came to Mab seeking refuge, kind of like Winter Winter did, so they have that in common. And she, like Marcone, has a lot of honor, but very little empathy, and she takes in strays that she uses as minions to do her bidding. It doesn't really matter what's right, just what helps create a base of power. Mab might protect the mortal world, but she has no reservations about the methods that she uses to do this, and it's very much a the end justifies the means type of thing. And people end up suffering. Apparently the Finnish wizards before joining the White Council had powers based on boasting, like when Harry tells himself and his enemies who he is and reinforces his own belief in his identity. And this all goes back to belief and that's why it ties in so well together with the way this entire magic system works and I thought that was really, really clever. Harry tooting his own horn, so to speak, might help him become stronger and his opponents weaker if they just start to doubt themselves. And this reminds me of when Lee gave Harry the confidence to beat Justin, but didn't necessarily juice up his powers. Though apparently that was still worth enough to get him into some pretty serious debt, and we all know how the whole trying to turn him into a hound thing ended up. Miss Lapland, who is Winter Winter's assistant, was probably a Lapland witch, an enemy of the Finnish wizards, and probably got her spell turned backwards, and that's why she acts really, really weird around Winter Winter. And Mab from Winter Winter's court records turned them out into the mortal realm right after the whole Arctic Store thing. And Winter Winter is basically a demigod, which makes him a great villain, even though Trip Gregory is really the villain villain of the story. But Winter Winter is the guy behind the curtains who he might not be in charge of what's going on, but he is definitely the bigger bad. This also made me think, and leave me a comment down below if you have more information on this, but I was wondering why Mab did that. Did she send Winter Winter out to befriend Marcone and to basically have a spy in his camp? Is she testing Marcone, trying to figure out if he's as powerful or available to be powerful in a good way to her? Is she trying to test Marcone for some reason? Is she trying to keep a potential threat busy? Like, what's going on here? It's really, really interesting. But for all the power that Winter Winter has, he actually shares a very big weakness with Harry in that both of them need Mab. They need Mab's protection from all the enemies, and they just need her to back them up on everything. And it's really bad to need a fairy queen because you end up doing some pretty bad stuff. In the other legal corner, we have Max, who is probably my favorite lawful good character since Michael in the series. Maximilian Valerius, Esquire, is the only lawyer to have beaten Winter Winter. His house is bright yellow and blue with an oak tree and tons of chickens, and his car is very, very old, which is something that would work with a wizard so, like, McCoy could drive it without everything breaking. So is he a practitioner, summer court aligned, just somebody who knows a little bit too much about the magical world? We don't know yet. His dog seems to like playing dumb like Mouse does, except he's a hound. But we all know that Mouse is a lot more than he lets on on the surface, so Max's dog could also have a lot more going on for it that we just don't know about yet. Max also checks out Harry with some golden spectacles that probably show him magical things. We know that there are ways for mortals to see into the magical world. We had the three-eye indulgence back in the first book. So having a magical object that can show you the same thing without completely messing you up probably makes a lot of sense if you're the right person. And Max also has his own version of the sign that Bilbo Baggins had on his front door where he wanted to send everybody away unless they were there on party business. So at the very least, Max has dealt with the magical community and kind of knows what he's up against. And that makes him pretty powerful in his own right. We just don't know why or how yet. Max receiving Dresden in his home office reminded me a lot of when Harry would receive big time supernatural folks in his PI office. But now Harry is the formidable supernatural person about to make someone's life much more interesting. He is reluctant to associate with Dresden. Folks who know about the magical community might turn against Dresden because they think that magical people attracted the trouble that led to the whole Battle of Chicago thing and the destruction that came from it. But Max decides to take the case because Dresden fights the good fight when he can, and Dresden reinforces that by saying that he believes that that's the way it should be. Max is very, very old, so he might not be a vanilla mortal. Again, I keep going back to this whole, like, who is Max thing. He could be a summer court changeling, and that's just why he's been able to live as long as he has. He also brings enough protection to make a difference in case Winter Winter wants to throw it down. And he just knows too much to just be a vanilla mortal. Okay, now we're getting into the analysis part, which is where we're going to dig deeper into a bunch of stuff. I just wanted to get through my like list of things I was excited about when I was reading the story. 
Harry has been becoming more than just our friendly neighborhood wizard PI for some time now. His character has grown and changed a lot in the last 17 books, and it's really important to keep that in mind going into the end game of the series. The reason that the law is so important is not just that it's a character's story in who Harry Dresden has been. It's also a character's study in who Harry Dresden is becoming. And I'm not trying to be rude here, but I think some people might have missed that idea. This story also introduces characters and helps set the stage for what's going to go down in 12 months. The Law is basically a very long prologue to the cooldown novel that promises to be mind-blowingly critical to the last part of the series. That's a lot to deal with, isn't it? So who is Harry Dresden, and what can we expect of him going forward as we get closer to the end game? Thematically, this is a story that shows Harry's overall growth as a character throughout the series. We start out with Harry taking on a job where he has to convince a guy to drop a frivolous legal case. We get this beautiful woman who's asking for help, but she's described much more respectfully than Dresden described women earlier in the series. This shows Dresden's maturity and growth, as well as being another move away from relying too heavily on the detective noir tropes that inspired the PI material earlier on. I know that faithfulness to the detective noir slash hard-boiled detective tropes made a lot of readers, mostly women, not want to continue with the series, so it's nice to see Harry's character grow up a bit. But this isn't traditional PI work, there's no direct investigation going on at the beginning, just a desperate person looking for help with a desperate situation. As Harry starts to do the work to get the lawsuit drop, he interacts with the supernatural beings and Trip Gregory, someone whose first name begins with a T, ends with a P, and he believes in strange theories that he sees on the news that aren't actually true. Side note, the heebie-jeebies were hilarious and also kind of aggravating because we know that magic is real in this universe, and this guy is doing literally everything that he can to stay in denial. In the Dresden Files graphic novel, Welcome to the Jungle, which I did a video on and I will link that in the description, Harry explains to Will, the research assistant, that people have been getting the heebie-jeebies for practically forever. Same as with Trip Gregory in this story, people go through a process of denial because the magical world is terrifying and there's not really anything that vanilla mortals can do about it. Ironically, the heebie-jeebies are being talked about in the media in the Dresdenverse in the wake of the Battle of Chicago and sold to the public as them experiencing a group hallucination that is best dealt with by just taking a nap until all the fake things seem to go away. I wish that could solve all my problems. That would be great. Dresden also talked about how the animals, using the jungle metaphor for Chicago, are the ones who see things for what they really are and do something about it, while at the same time reverting to their nature to eat or be eaten and staining their mortal souls in one way or another in the process. Trip might be oblivious to this last point, as he's only in it for himself to pay off the debts and save his own skin, but he drags a lot of the magical community into his problems. But in a post-Battleground Dresden verse, denial is more than just an annoying enemy to deal with while solving and on the surface trivial case. Mass Denial also works against Harry as he tries to power up in the last couple books before the Big Apocalypse trilogy. Combating widespread denial probably explains why Molly is trying to get the word out about the Wizard of Chicago by signing his name on the from tag on all the gifts that she handed out in her Christmas short story, The Good People, which I'll also link down in the description because I did a video on that one too. If people believe Harry is this powerful entity that can protect them or help them rebuild their lives, then Harry can power himself up through people's belief in him. We all know from the fake Shroud of Truin thing that the thing that people believe in doesn't necessarily have to be true in order for the belief to work. At least not to full capacity. Harry can make up a mantle, and if people believe in him, then it becomes something powerful that he can use later on, and that's going to be really, really important. Which is probably why it's a reoccurring theme, because I feel like I've talked about this a million times by now. In some ways, Trip is either really, really similar or a foil to Dresden earlier in the series. Both characters are smart mouths with very little power. That might seem odd considering that Dresden has always been an exceptionally powerful wizard, but Trip also has the favor of John Marcone, and that gives him a decent amount of chips to cash in. After all, Marcone knows that rewarding loyalty is a great way to keep people in his organization in line. Harry has pizza. Marcone has small favors. Trip is a sleazebag, and early in the series, Dresden is considered by some to be a slime ball with how he describes women in his head. They're opposites, but oddly similar. For the record, I don't think that early Dresden Files Dresden was as creepy as Trip is, but he definitely had some growing up to do. Trip ends up doing something that gets him in trouble and sent to jail with Triple J to look over him and keep an eye on him. 
If they had a better relationship, maybe Triple J could have been Trip's Ebenezer. But Triple J ends up being to Marcone more what Ebenezer McCoy is to the White Council. Someone to keep an eye on him and do the dirty work if asked to do so. Eventually, Trip gets out into the world and gets a second chance. Like Dresden, Trip finds himself over his head and also has some favors owed to him by powerful beings. At one point, Dresden even offers Trip a place as his vassal and an obligation to go after the Missouri guys who are after him in exchange for dropping the case. Like Dresden has done a ton of times in the past, Trip refuses and trusts his own spunk to get him out of his troubles that he's gotten himself into in the first place. But unlike Harry, at least for now, things don't work out for him and the ending of the law was a little bit ambiguous but I think we all know how it went down. Off screen there was not a happy ending for Trip Gregory. This might be because Trip is a literal walnut and it was a good way to wrap up the story or it might give us a clue to Harry's eventual fate. Harry could end up getting his own comeuppance. I can see Mab leaving him to fend for himself if she ever thinks that he's not worthy of being her knight. And the White Council basically put the doom of Damocles back on him when he was expelled from their order. So it's really possible that Harry doesn't play the power games exactly right and ends up losing big time in the end. Harry starts out the story up to his old PI tricks, turns into an enforcer as he tries to intimidate the idiot, then starts trying to get Marcone and others involved to be on his side. When that doesn't work, Harry finds a way to fix it. He ends up making deals and offering the idiot protection. Later, we see him get out of a traffic ticket because the officer is a veteran of the Battle of the Bean and sees Harry as his leader and lets him pass. Then Harry calls that meeting in the warehouse that the wardens use for dispensing justice on people who break the laws of magic, you know, where it's easy to clean up afterwards. And he ends up brokering a path forward like he's some sort of signatory of the Accords, even though he's just Mab's henchman at this point. But like a signatory or similarly leveled person, at the end, he decides that he doesn't want to be involved anymore and someone else suffers the consequences. The entire end of the story is both telling and pretty funny with how hard Dresden stresses technicalities to get his way. Because Miss Lapland and Tripp both tried to violate the accords against Dresden that night, you know, with the car and the bear thing. And because Tripp is a vassal of Marcones, it has become an accords issue. Since Miss Lapland works for Winter Winter, who works for Marcone, her actions make him involved as well. After all, controlling your vassals is a really big part about being a freeholding ward. Side note, I think that there's a little bit going on with the whole Tal of the Inferno thing being Winter Winter's name, or at least the one he goes by in public right now. Also, we find out that Mab is still a little bit shook up from the whole Battle of the Titan thing. If she was at her full power, I think she'd be tempted to make Dresden regret dragging her into his petty issues. But when has that ever stopped him? Marcone says that this is a personal matter since Dresden was not acting in the service of Winter, and Harry says that it does involve Winter because they damaged the company car, where others could see the damage and bring shame to the whole reputation of Mab. After all, if it's okay to bang up Mab's car, it's okay to do other things to her and her henchmen, and that cannot be tolerated. Mab thinks this is stupid, and it is. Tell me your opinion in the comments down below. But technically, she has to act. Neither Mab or Marcone want to punish their minions because they don't want to take them out of play. More ends justifying the means stuff. But in the end, it's all about balancing forces, and Harry asks for Trip to drop the case in exchange for evening the scales. And when Trip says no, Harry asks for a fair fight in court, and that is granted. Winter Winter losing to Immortal is payment enough for Lapland's actions because it really embarrasses Winter Winter. Marcone takes Winter Winter's word that Lapland will be punished as payment for her attacking Trip, his vassal. And it reminds me of the way that Harry shook off Eldis Gruff by using his one wish with the summer court to get him a donut, giving Harry time to escape in the process. And it just reminds me that sometimes the smallest gestures can fulfill the biggest obligations. White frosting with sprinkles. Dresden tells Winter Winter that people should judge other people and not let things like Laplin be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And this is completely opposite to the way that the White Council tends to do things. They like to pass judgment on people and carry it out very, very quickly. And there's not really anybody's opinion asked or anybody even thinking about, is this the right thing to do in the first place? By the end of the story, Harry's offered protection to Trip against the Missouri guys and acted as much more of a bully than he did before he took up the mantle of the Winter Knight. Dresden's also starting to pick and choose who to help and when to help them. He could have saved Trip at the end, but he didn't. And that's the kind of thing that I would expect from Mab or Lara or even Marcone, but not from Dresden. Dresden's also negotiated a solution with members of the Unsealy Accords all on his own without anybody backing him up. It was reinforced that Harry has his own minions and band of supporters and enforcers and the Order of the Bean behind him. And it also shows that he has, surprisingly, Marcone's respect, which was hilarious. This man stole a castle from you, and all you can say is well played. 
that is probably one of my favorite parts of this entire story because I thought that Marcone was going to be much more upset about that than he actually ended up being. Now let's get into the setup for 12 months. We've met the two attorneys. We have Mr. Winter Winter and Maximus Valerius, whose name means maximum strength or valor. Mab needs a lawyer to look over the contracts before Harry and Lara's first date, and her vassal thing, Winter Winter, seems like he could be the man for the job. Max's house reminds me a little bit of the Carpenter house in the Summer Court's gentler side, and there could be way more to why Max is so concerned about how he acts with the supernatural community. We assume that any lawyer who doesn't have the heebie-jeebies would be careful, but it's almost like he knows who he's dealing with and who is more dangerous to bargain with than the Fae. He tells his wife not to call the police and don't call your mother. So what does that mean? Is his mother-in-law, lol, someone who could try to protect him from Dresden if needed? And also, while I'm thinking about it, does it ever come right out and say who Heloise is? Like, is she his wife? Is she someone else? Or do they just act like an old married couple? Do we ever see her or just hear her in another room? She might not even be human for all we know. Max and Heloise are supposedly a Princess Bride reference to Max and Valerie. I haven't watched that movie in a while, but considering that Brandon Sanderson was inspired by it when he wrote Tress of the Emerald Sea... I think it's probably trending again. Inconceivable. Side note, I did look it up, and Heloise is a German slash French name, meaning famous warrior, healthy, and wide. There is no wordsy connection to the Greek word Helios, which means sun or sunshine. The possibility of a connection made me think of summer until I looked it up, but a couple whose names mean maximum valor and famous warrior lend themselves well to a couple that makes their living representing the little guy. It was a good theory while it lasted, and this happens a lot. I recently reread Little Things, the short story that happens post Battleground, where Toot Toot and Mr. team up to fight some gremlins who invade the castle. And Toot refers to all the stainless steel furniture and appliances in the castle's kitchen as being the bane, or just as effective against them as cold iron. It doesn't seem to bother Harry, though. This bothers me because it really should bother Harry with his winter mantle, making him a part of the fairy courts and him not having dual membership in the White Council anymore. If he gets the extra power and strength and benefits from his mantle, he should get some of the downsides too. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything, but stainless steel definitely counts here. We also know that Harry loses some of the power of the Winter Night Mantle by crossing over thresholds, so it still bothers me tremendously why it doesn't work on the whole appliance thing. Like, if he touches a table, is he going to feel bad? He doesn't. It, it just doesn't make sense. And just in case I said that in a confusing way, a lot of the furniture and appliances in the kitchen are stainless steel. And that's because stuff doesn't grow on stainless steel, and so it's better for food so that you don't get germs and stuff in your food. So if Harry can make coffee and exist in a room full of the bane, being the winter night, it just doesn't make sense to me and it bothers me. In chapter 12, Bob says that paranoid Gary's skull would make a great apartment because Gary is weird but organized. Harry says that he's not going to create that availability and spend years enchanting the skull so that Bob can have a summer home. This throwaway line got me thinking, whose skull does Bob live in now? And doesn't impact him in any way. What about Bonnie's wooden skull? Does that make a difference here? I started down that rabbit hole and there's a bit too much speculation to not make it a video on its own. So it's going to join the list of videos that I need to make. Going back to the whole could Max be summer court aligned thing, I think it would be a really easy way to balance out summer and winter if they both had an attorney on payroll. And probably unrelated, but Max defending Sunflower, the tutoring service from winter, has summer vibes all, all on its own. We also know that Max was offered pizza at the end, which is how Harry pays toot toot. So it's safe to say that Max is team Dresden and on the payroll right now. Paranoid Gary was also invited to game night. And that means that we're probably going to see more of him, and he's probably going to be a bigger part of Team Dresden going forward. Mutual respect brings all the baddies together. And this might be just the Denarians trying to keep tabs on Harry. Side note, the whole Marcone taking up the coin thing makes all the oh crap moments of skin game where they pop out of Hades in one of Marcone's safes make a lot more sense. It's not breaking in if you're basically family. And I'm not sure if Marcone has ties to the Missouri guys that Trip owed money to or not. If he did, then both he and Dresden are people who aided Trip in some endeavors and not in others. Now let's talk about some clues that we have for Harry when he ends up marrying Laura. Harry comes into this marriage with a castle, but he only has a year and a half's worth of money to keep it going, making his marriage to Laura important since the white cord is loaded. She literally has daddy's pocketbook backing her up, and that is substantial. Lara can also be an ally that can keep the government off his case since she has influence over important people in the vanilla mortal community that Harry doesn't. 
just keeping someone from connecting the dots between the Battle of Chicago and his office building going bye-bye and changes and accusing him of being responsible for it has got to have cost someone a lot of money and or favors. I know that there was that one sympathetic FBI agent in changes, but there's probably other people behind the scenes working things, especially the ones that were working with Rudolph at that point. Dresden says that if it's about power, he has some of that too. But to him, it's about what the right thing to do is. To me, this says that he retains some of the humanity that he almost lost when he almost took vengeance on Rudolph in Battleground. This entire series is about a guy trying to do the right thing and turning into a bad or at least morally gray guy in the process. It's kind of like an early version of Mab. See the discussion about how she saves people. Laura has said that she will give people peace, that the people will love her for it, and that it will be her way of destroying them. So far, and I'm only just now rereading changes, but I see Laura as kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing. She's someone who is a bad guy keeping in everyone's good graces because that's the most advantageous thing to do. She might not be team outsiders, but she's not someone who deep down is trying to be moral. Harry is. Harry almost went over the edge in Battleground, and it might have taken two Knights of the Cross to do it, but he isn't the monster that his fiance is. They aren't going to be partners with aligning goals. They're just going to butt heads eventually and everything's going to like get bad real quick. So that is my long-winded and frankly convoluted discussion of The Law by Jim Butcher. If you like Dresden Files content, you should subscribe to my channel because I do a lot of it. And hopefully it will not be three weeks between when I do a video and when I do the next one. Life is hard, but I'm trying to make time for y'all. And I really appreciate everyone who discusses things and just makes this entire experience a lot of fun for everyone. Thanks.